So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on our webinar today. Um, I'm Rich Harvey, CEO of Property Buyer, and today I've got Theo Chambers, who's the CEO and founder of Shaw Financial. So just to give a little bit of background, today we're going to be talking about the market, we'll be talking about interest rates, we'll be talking about financing, long-term strategies, long-term property prices, and lots of case studies, Theo. So everyone's in for a bit of a treat today, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so just to introduce Theo, Theo is the founder of Shaw Financial, Australia's largest lending mortgage brokers that have grown very large since their inception. Um, they started out with just three staff members writing five million a month. Today, they're processing over 300 million a month and have a team of 54 professionals. Um, so they're a multi-award winner like ourselves. So Theo, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you to share your screen and uh, take us through the first part of the presentation today. Thanks, Rich. That's a um, lovely introduction. I should also highlight that, um, you know, one of our key um, values to to our clients is um, actually uh, helping them create wealth through property. Um, we're a, a very relationship driven business. It's not just mm -hmm. our volume that's our accolades, but also our um, our care towards our clients and their individual outcomes. You know. Um, I'm just sharing the screen now. One second. All right. I think everybody can see that. It's coming up. Perfect, mate. Well done. Yeah. So like I said, um, we're a, a um, advice focused mortgage brokerage, been operating for 11 years. Um, and we we like to help our clients create wealth through property. That's why we love partnering up with with individuals like yourself, Rich, and and helping our clients, um, you know, find good investment opportunities because we find that a lot of people need handholding when it comes to investing. They sometimes can sit on the, on the fence procrastinating about buying an investment property for some time. Um, so goal today, I'm not going to harp on too much about interest rates because the media does that for us enough these days. Um, but just in a quick nutshell, we'll give a bit of a finance, um, update, and then we'll talk about what to expect, um, in the year ahead and, um, some co considerations on investment strategies for individuals. So firstly, everyone knows this, the RBA is trying to achieve a two to 3%, um, CPI target. We're not far off that. The most recent data that came out in January was 3.4. Um, but we we might see some some sticky inflation around this level. It might bounce up at this level. So uh, as Michelle Bullock addressed the the media yesterday, rates still could have one more increase left in them, um, or they could start coming down in the near future. It's one of those things that we just need to stay tuned. Um, just wanted to highlight. Last 25 years, we've seen the cash rate go up and then come down straight after, which is exactly what, what is happening at the moment. The most aggressive, aggressive increases we've seen on record in on the cash rate, on record being uh, near 30 years, um, and it will come down shortly. Um, the US, quite similar. Um, the US were a bit, was a bit more aggressive in their increases in terms of the actual increments. Um, and they're the ones that will probably lead the decreases as well. Um, they're, they're most likely going to start decreasing before we do, which will be a strong indicator on um, where we'll we'll see our increases come into effect. Uh, inflation, you can see they've done a, a great job at tackling inf inflation in both marketplaces, um, where the US has has come right back down to to sub sub four percent, as have we. This this last slide doesn't actually show the most recent increase, a uh, decrease, I should say, in inflation. Like I said, we're at 3.4%. Um, we're almost back just, in the band, uh, Theo. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, exactly. that 3%, I think when, we're almost, almost there, you know? And and something that actually the economists in our last joint web, webinar said together, um, Andrew Wilson, wasn't it? Um, yeah. He did call out something I completely agree with, where I do think inf the inflation target needs to be a like a revolving or a moving a, target, reviewed, a yeah. moving target that we, we review on an ongoing basis. Like yeah. every 12 months, we need to review what the target is and, and think what's a, a, what's best for the economy. Because mm -hmm. if you look right there on that, on the Australian inflation um, data for the last 10 years, we've been struggling to get it above sort of 2% for almost a decade, right? Um, it's been sort of down towards half a percent to a percent, um, it's that's not what the economy wants. So now we've finally got it firing. We're we're trying to slow it back down again. Um, but yeah, just touching on what does these obviously everyone knows what these crazy interest rate increases mean for consumers. Uh, one being repayment increases, but two more importantly, um, which does make buying quite opportunistic at the moment. 
it's the decrease in people's borrowing power. So that last um, increase we had in November uh, it, it equated to a total uh, reduction on the average borrowing capacity of about 47% now. So if you spoke to us two years ago in early 2022, just before the rates started increasing, and we told you you could borrow $2 million, it's now more like $1 million. Big difference. Um, we've, we've spoke about this in the past, so I won't harp on about it too much, but just um, to hash out the infamous mortgage cliff that was all over the media once again, um, we're through the peak of of those. So what the mortgage cliff is, is the fixed rate mortgages um, coming to maturity, the fixed rate loans from COVID, which were 2% um, for three, four years or two to four years, let's say. Um, the bulk of them were coming to maturity uh, in the last six months. You can see right there from July till till December, basically. Um, and they were rolling off 2% and, and uh, reverting to a, a revert variable rate of 6%. Um, we're through that the bulk of those um, changes. And I personally do think it is directly correlated to the increased um, supply we had the last couple of months. Um, and I think if we move on, you can see what that what that meant for consumers. So 2.1% to 6.1%. Um, let's just use the $1 million loan as an example. Your payments went from $3,700 a month to $6,000 a month. Big difference. Um, so some people I think were were waiting for that change. They could see the change coming and they would uh, make changes, you know, not necessarily once they're in arrears and and struggling, but, you know, they could forecast the the, the repayments, um, the, the hurdle in repayments that were, were coming and they're making transitional changes. So when I say transitional changes, um, people aren't necessarily sell, uh, selling and going to renting, but um, just downsizing even incrementally by 20%, let's say, and just bringing down their, their debt, um, There'll, there'll probably be some more data around that soon because the current arrears data that we've been seeing is six months old. It takes um, 90 days for arrears to be reported and then it's another quarter for reporting to come through. So it's six months old. So I think the, the next quarter is going to show some some um, more aggressive increases in arrears, I think. Um, this is an interesting one. It just goes to show the buoyancy of our property market. The... Um, the orange line you can see shows the uh, average borrowing capacity across Sydney and the blue line on the right there shows the average um, house price. So you can see that the average borrowing capacity and the average house price have been quite related for the last sort of 15, 20 years. Um, and then since COVID, you know, well, since the increase in interest rates, I should say, uh, borrowing capacities have been smashed, you know, like I like that earlier slide, 47%. But house prices keep uh, keep running. Um, and that just shows that despite the affordability crisis, which is, is exactly what this is, um, people are still buying property and still making it work. Um, and it, it's a robust a, a, a property market as such in Sydney in particular. Um, this was some of the data that came out in December that was the, was the reason that uh, many people, many economists started uh, speculating that um, rates are going to come down sooner rather than later, this and the decreasing inflation. So this just showed the um, uh, retail sort of consumer spending data decreasing more aggressively than they were anticipating. So 2.7%. But you can see there the three categories that really took a hit were somewhat discretionary, household goods, clothing, footwear, and department stores. Um, other other sort of uh, household spending items stayed quite quite strong. Um, some actually even increase with people sort of um, shifting their habits to, to more value driven items. Um, I like showing this slide just because it highlights how sentiment is a bigger driver for prices than sometimes economic activity or economic um, data as such. So what I mean by that, in 2022, when rates were forecasted to start going up, that's when prices came down, but rates were still very low. So you can see there from March 22, June 22, and September 22, prices came off. Uh, house prices, dwelling prices across Australia came off. Um, and But rates back then, they only increased incrementally. They were still record low. They were still, call it 3%, 3.5%. And ironically, last year where rates are peaking at let's say 6%, six, uh, early sixes for, for investors, prices have ran. Um, so whilst borrowing capacities are crippled, um, sentiment is strong because people can see the 
the end of the tunnel and they can they can see the light at the end of the tunnel and realize that well rates only going to stay this high for a short period of time now's the time to to, to transact and buy um and that is just confidence it's really, if i can just jump in there Theo, it's a really good point and and i study the data every every day every week pretty much and and looking back say you know around september 19 on your chart where the total value of of residential housing was around seven uh, trillion dollars. Um, it's now at ten point, uh, about ten point three trillion. So a phenomenal rise, like almost a twenty five percent rise in values over a four four and a half year period. So it obviously it makes it really difficult for those that haven't entered the property market, whereas for those that have entered the property market, it's a lot easier because they can leverage. So I think. One of the key messages is, look, it's it's never too late to get into the market, but the sooner you do, the sooner you can ride these cycles and ride these waves to get to achieve your goals. Mm. No, definitely. So yeah, I thought that's a interesting data to share there. Um, we won't talk about migration because I think you're going to touch on that, aren't you, Rich? Um, yeah. mm. But there's, there's always a direct correlation between uh, increasing population and increasing property prices domains data there just shows a, a 1% in population, 1% increase equates to an 8% rise in property values nationwide. Um, that's that supply uh, issue that Rich will, will talk more about, but you can quickly see on the blue line there that we're at a, a 10 year low um, in housing supply and record high um, population change, population growth. Um, so going back to, Interest rates and the forecast, like I said, it's been a, a bit of a, um, a yo-yo, you could say, in, in which way the the, the rates, are, the forecast on which way rates are going to go. You know, um, these major bank economists have been changing their forecasts every three, four weeks as data comes out. Um, at the moment, I think half of them are forecasting rates to start coming down by about June. The other half are saying um, by the end of the year. The, the, that's the out of the four major bank economists I'm, I'm referring to. Um, but if we just look at what's it going to, where's it going to land, um, let's say in 18 months, by the end of next year, they're all sort of forecasting by the end of next year, rates should come down, you know, at least sort of one and a half percent, call it. Um, my favorite is Bill Evans, which is Westpac. He's normally the most accurate. Um, 3.1% by September next year is, mm. is his, his forecast. What does that mean as a consumer rate? It's about four and a half percent as a consumer rate retail rate to borrowers, um, which is pretty much in line with the, the last 10 year average. Um, so this window of high rates is short lived and it does make purchasing property right now somewhat opportunistic, like I, like I mentioned earlier, just thought it's worth shouting out about these, um, tax changes that got a lot of airtime in the media as well. Um, the stage three tax cuts, um, the, the beneficiary are the, individuals um, earning between 45 to 120,000. As you can see there, um, the, the people earning 100, uh, sorry, 45,000 to 120,000 have gone from a 32.5% um, tax rate down to 30. Uh, and, the, and the ones below as well went from 19 to six, 16. Um, but the other brackets didn't move as a tax rate as such. However, the actual brackets change, you can see there, it went from 120 to 135, um, where the change became effect to the next next tier, and 180 to 190 when when you start going to up to 40, 45 cents in the dollar. Um, what does that actually mean to borrowers? It does actually have a, a, an effect to your borrowing capacity because whilst your income might not have changed, um, your net position has changed because it's after tax money, obviously that you're getting in your pocket. Um, so, like I said, the, the the main beneficiaries around that that one hundred fifty thousand dollars income, um, you would have seen a six percent increase in your borrowing um, capacity if you had a, a an extra one hundred forty uh, if you were earning that one hundred forty thousand um, dollars. So that does make a difference, especially after all these um, uh, rate increases and decreases in, in borrowing capacity. Um, I won't touch on every line here, but we're going to go into comparing asset classes in, in a couple slides. And um, to do so, I just wanted to highlight the different markets that we we are sort of financing our clients into purchasing investments. Um, Sydney being our core market uh, for, for Shore Financial, um, as you can see there, the last 10-year average is, is, is 7%, the change in um, house prices at the bottom. 
Um, if you go over to the right, you can see at the bottom, the average uh, increase in unit prices is 4%. So houses have outperformed units in, in Sydney. Um, and then you can also see the um, rental yields and the change in yields. So average rental yields on the units is a little bit higher, 4% versus 3%, um, but a 4% increase on the on the um, house prices rent to that 3%. So historically, it was a little bit lower. Um, we'll move on to, to Melbourne. Melbourne, unfortunately, didn't have the best market for units, um, only a 2% increase for the last 10 years if you owned a unit in Melbourne on average. Um, a house has done done a lot better in Melbourne, 6%. Some would argue, I'm sure Rich might might say that that, that does then uh, mean units might be a bit more attractive at the moment. Um, you've got to be careful what you're buying. It is all about supply and demand once again. And I think a direct um, correlation with that figure there of 2% growth in Melbourne is for the supply of units in certain markets in Melbourne, wouldn't you say, Rich? Yeah, it's really, it's very, very localised. I think, you, I mean, there's some great yields you can get in Melbourne now. Um, but again, you've got to be really selective about which suburbs you buy into. Mm. Yeah, it's not as it's not as um, hard to get DAs on big unit developments down in Melbourne as it is in Sydney. So supply mm. was definitely stronger down there, mm. historically, that is. Um, and the next one, Brisbane. Brisbane's a hot topic at the moment or has been for a while. I think Rich has been talking about Brisbane for, for, for several years. Um, 6% increases on, on houses, 4% increases on units. Uh, the yields are, are a bit stronger, 4% on houses and 5% on units. Um, we're going to use some of these assumptions then in a in a comparison for a negatively geared or a positively geared investment strategy. Um, lastly, Perth, um, a more recent hot topic in, in the investor space at the moment, um, Perth that is. Uh, we're seeing a 2% average historically there in houses, but you can see for the last three years some a bit more... Um, sort of aggressive growth, six to 12%, 12% consistently the last sort of um, two years. Um, and units only 1%, uh, but 5% yield. Um, in some, once again, you can see there in the units, 11% just in the last year alone, uh, and a 13% increase there in the yield. If you look at that most recent year in, in 2024, same as houses in 2024, 17% increase in, in rent. So if you did transact in those markets a couple of years ago, uh, it would be a quite quite. So, a, yeah, just return. one point. So just we go back one slide. Yeah. Make. A really good point to make. A lot of people say to me, Rich, oh, I should be buying where you're going to get a 17% increase in rent or 12% increase in yield. But the problem is if you're coming to the party now, are you coming too late? And I think there's always a good point to make. And you've heard that expression, a reversion to the mean. You know, what are the mm. fundamental drivers for the Perth market or whatever market you're looking at, the Adelaide market, Brisbane market? What are the drivers for the next five and 10 years, not just the next two years? Like you can get, no doubt, someone can get some immediate growth, but property you're going to be holding for a longer term. So I just would advise people just to think about the longer term hold strategy, if that's your strategy in buying a property in certain areas. Yeah, 100%. That's a great shout. And I think one of the big drivers for for Perth was affordability. We, we even had some of our own team members relocate to, to Perth because you know, you could buy a house for a, a, a lot less than it costs you in, in Sydney. But if you look at 2021 there, you know, something that they were looking at two, three years ago for 600,000 is now 900,000. That's a big difference, right? So um, those drivers might not be as, as apparent as they once were. Um, so if we compare these markets, now um, there's one more asset class that we normally have in our comparison that we didn't put on this one, but um, the other asset class I, I, I want to include is the ASX 200. The reason I want to include the ASX 200 is um, if you're a, an investor looking at all your options, then you should also, um, you, you most likely also have got some money invested in the ASX indirectly, probably through a super fund, let's say. Um, and historically, I don't have it here, but I, I know for a fact you can Google it yourselves. Um, the ASX the last 10 years, um, Capital growth plus yield, so the combination of both these columns that you're seeing in front of you for for, for growth and, and yield, combination of the two for the ASX last 10 year historical average was 7.9%, um, where you, you've achieved that just in growth in some of these marketplaces um, in property. And the big difference between the ASX or a super fund uh, invested in shares um, versus investing in property is that when you invest in shares, you, you most likely aren't gearing that with a margin loan 
or having gearing within the ETF, unless you're an aggressive investor. Um, so you're, let's say your 250 grand would be entirely invested in the ASX. Whereas if you put $250,000 towards a $1 million property, well, you're getting 7% on the bank's money. Um, and the yield should somewhat cover your interest costs, which, which leads into my next sort of, um, slide on, on, um, on property comparisons with that 250, but another one coming up, sorry, on negative versus positive. So that's the comparison. If you had 250 grand and you invested it in all these marketplaces, what does it look like in 10 years? Um, the 250 in your super that was in shares and ASX would have just doubled in 10 years because it is compounding. So 7.9% over 10 years, you would have doubled your money. However, if you had that 250 and you bought a million dollar property and you assumed that the the rent was covering the, the mortgage, which which my um, next slide will, will, will outline, then that 250 has essentially turned to an asset value of 1.8. Um, yes, there's some debt on there, but you've definitely magnified the the growth far more aggressively than than you would in in the ASX or your, your, your super fund. Um, if we look at other markets, the Melbourne house price, 1 million's turned to 1.68, um, similar to Brisbane houses, basically exactly the same. Um, and yeah, I guess even those less performing assets are still getting attractive, attractive growth. You can really see the compounding effect. If you're looking at an investment strategy um, for for your super, for example, and it's a 20 year plan, well, that 250 grand to buy a $1 million property in 20 years, it could be a three and a half million dollar asset, as you can see there in Sydney houses. Um, and in about 10 years, most even if it was negatively geared, most of those assets turn positive and and there'll be some aggressive amortization in that second 10 year window. Uh, which does lead into my next slide. So like I said, I think it's important to evaluate what type of investor you are and what strategy suits you. So are you a negatively geared investor, which is that that left column, or are you a positively geared investor being that right column? The difference between the two, the obvious one, can you afford to contribute a, a monthly amount to your investment property? Or are you hoping to have it at least break even and, and if, if anything, pay you a return? So- I'm not going to go through line by line here, but at the top, you can see in, in the Sydney house example being the negatively geared example, 250 grand buying you a $1 million property at 80%. If we use actual historical averages being 3% rental yield, which is quite low compared to other markets, the average interest rate, I've actually been a bit conservative and used 5% when it was about four and a half. Um, we've put some expenses in there. We've even put depreciation averages in there. Um, you get a bit of a rebate on that depreciation if you assume that 120 to 180 income bracket that you're in, um, a 10 to $13,000 rebate from that depreciation and negatively geared loss. Um, what does it end up costing you per year? Call it about $1,000 a month, between fourteen to $12,000 a, a year. Um, in the positively geared scenario, all we've done is use the same amount of, of, of capital and just make that capital equate to a more significant deposit being 70% LVR um, or 30% deposit as opposed to 80% in, in Sydney and also targeting a property that is, is yielding a bit more aggressively. Um, so this one, the Brisbane unit, 5% as opposed to the house in Sydney at 3%. Um, and if we just go down the bottom, it's, it's about a two to $3,000 um, sort of positive cash flow at the end of the year. Um, what does that look like in 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 ten years time? Um, the two hundred fifty grand would have a, a one the the one million dollar property would have be worth one point eight million dollars. The debt with the amortization would be around six fifty. Um, the rent's gone up to forty four thousand a year. It's increased using those historical averages. Um, so if we go down the bottom, what's the total ROI? You've you've accrued one point one million in equity. So that two fifty has turned into one point one million, one point one eight, I should say. Um, in 10 years, that's 16.9% ROI. So if we compare it to that 7.99% ASX 10-year average, it's basically double. Um, and the Brisbane unit, pretty much the same, 14.8% ROI. Um, that 250 has turned into 996,000 accrued equity. Um, that's, the, the I think, the real attractive reason I think people need to be a bit more proactive mm -hmm. in their investment strategy because... You can you can turn two hundred fifty grand into a million dollars quite passively, in 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 my opinion. I think yeah, they're great examples. And just for everyone watching, by the way, I've sent a note on the chat saying that you'll be getting a copy of these um, slides. But 
just back to you, one comment I just make there, really love the way you've outlined that. Um, and there's different strategies for different people. You know, I think uh, we get a lot of clients coming to us on, on lower incomes, you know, sub 100. And it's much better to do the right-hand side of the Brisbane unit or a positive cash flow style property because that's the only way that they can really achieve their goals. And yeah, sure, they might sacrifice 2% total ROI over 10 years, but they still get to achieve their goals. Whereas someone on a much higher income, say 150, 200 plus, they could afford to negative gear. They could carry that, you know, and use their tax dollars a lot more smartly. So there's not a one size fits all and there's different types of properties and locations that'll deliver that, that strategy of outline there. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point there, Rich. The the negatively geared asset is definitely for the higher income earners, you know, above 180. I've used 120 to 180 as the as the example in those rebates, but really you should only be be targeting ne negatively geared assets if you're earning above that 180 to 190 threshold. Um, and you you want that rebate and you can comfortably commit to something every year for 10 years, let's say. The, if if you're not in that category, it's much safer, much easier just to have a positively geared asset. And you can see here on that Brisbane unit, by being positively geared, you can see the LVR, the, the amortization has dropped down to 30% um, after after 10 years. So you, you're in a much more comfortable position. You're not worried about in that left scenario, having a, a 650 mortgage as opposed to 420 after after 10 years. And if you're, you're looking at still doing things in your personal name, like upsizing your home, it does make a difference. Um, just quickly, we'll um, call out the major bank economist prediction on, or forecast, I should say, on on uh, house prices across the the, the country. Um, they've all sort of said five to six percent growth this year through 2024. They've um, on the right, you can see they've broken it down into markets in particular. Brisbane's a hot one that they're all all forecasting as as good growth. You know, eight to ten percent. Um, Westpac, that Bill Evans is is liking Perth, another ten percent. He's thinking, um, but I'll let Rich go into some of those things. Um, just mindful of time, I'll let Rich talk about some of these um, reasons why now is a good time to invest. So, yep, the fundamental supply and demand issue that we all know about, um, demand is increasing and supply is decreasing in in, in housing. Um, we've seen uh, the lowest vacancy rates ever in in. Um, in the sort of rental market, mm -hmm. rents are going up with inflation comes increases in rent. Uh, that's also off the back of increasing interest rates. Uh, interest rates are expected to, dro to drop. So your, your holding costs of a, an investment property are expected to, to drop. Um, and that will lead to, to the potential of capital growth. Lastly, just our state of Sydney report, we do use some um, fancy algorithms to forecast growth. It, it has been a report that's been released for the last three years. It did get us on 2GB and, and Channel 9 News. Um, it, we use real estate portal data, just uh, basically days on market, asking price versus sold price and all the, all the variables that you would imagine that uh, you can get from a real estate portal. Um, and we break Sydney into five quintiles and we pick our favorite areas of growth and uh, most promising suburbs and what they should look like. You can hop on our website and request a copy of this. Um, I won't go through every every item, but you can see we're still picking um, uh, markets that are prices around a million dollars have over 5% growth, um, even in more affluent areas of, of um, houses around one and a half to two and a half still has attractive growth. Um, and the more affluent areas, um, affluent Sydney, we call it, um, that pocket, which which Rich I know loves is the, the Northern Beaches pocket. Um, that's also looking promising, even in the affluent end of town. I'll move on to you, Rich, because I'm just mindful of time. No worries. Excellent, mate. Well, thank you. If you want to just uh, stop sharing uh, your screen, then I'll, I'll jump into my presentation if I can. Uh, just have a look. Yep. There we, there we go. go. Sweet. Let me just uh, share my screen and then I'll get stuck into my one. So I think it's going to be that one there. All right. Um, <laughs> it's for some reason it decided to freeze on me. I don't know why. It's a bit annoying. I had it all ready to go, but let me just try it again now. So give me one. Maybe second. should I look at some of these questions? Um, yeah, yeah. Just jump on that if you could. Um, what is the likelihood of changes to negative gearing and capital gains tax, Greg? I love this question. Um, it's it's somewhat of a political question. Um, I, given the really low vacancy rates in, in, in the rental market and the housing crisis for tenants. I'd be really surprised if the, the federal government came out with some 
um, changes that disincentivize investors because that's just going to worsen that problem. Um, we need to be doing the opposite. We need to be encouraging or, or creating incentives for investors um, to to create homes for tenants to rent um, and also for developers to be able to um, stack up feasibilities to, to, to build property um, and create more, more homes for people, not just to, to rent, but to, to purchase. Um, so I'd be surprised it would be, it has been thrown around um, in, in sort of lead up to elections in the past. Um, I think in 2019, it got a lot of airtime and it, it is what caused the Labor Party to not get in back in 2019. Yeah, I agree. Because... I don't think it's going to happen at all. I think it's, uh, yeah, it, it's... they won't touch it. I think they might fiddle with depreciation laws or a few more taxes, but they won't stop negative gearing. It's going to completely ruin the, the rental market if they do make it worse. So, and, yeah. and I think both, you know, Liberal and Labor voters own a home and, 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 and don't want, um, you know, different laws coming in because they're talking about the, the capital gains tax exemption on your primary residence even being um, up for consideration. So it doesn't matter which which way you vote, um, these implications are going to affect everyone and so no one's really for it, in my opinion. Well, I've managed to get the screen back up again. You're seeing that okay, Theo? All good? Yep. Yep, sweet. Well, I'll just jump into this. So um, just quickly, I think a lot of you know my background, but been in the game uh, just over 23 and a half years, um, multi award winning like Theo in, in terms of the way we, we do it, actually managed to win Thought Leader of the Year last year in the buyer's agent industry. So really proud of that. Um, also a qualified property investment advisor. Um, so that's my background. Um, what I want to talk about today is just give you guys a bit more of a snapshot of what's actually happening in the property market. Talk about the impact of migration and continuing surges there. Talk a bit about buyer psychology and then jump into some case studies as well. So what's happening in the market? I get asked this every day of the week. Rich, how's the market? When I say, well, which market are we talking about? So I'm going to talk generally about the market and then I'll talk about different cities after that. Um, as Theo pointed out, property is very um, sentiment driven and uh, Westpac and the Melbourne Institute measure consumer net index uh, sentiment every month. And you can see it's been bumping around about 80 points for the last you know, year and a half since interest rates started rising. You know, it's hit the hip pocket nerve. So people aren't spending as much. So sentiment is down and that has a flow on effect to demand. Um, last week in the auction clearance rates, they're holding pretty steady. Um, in fact, this coming weekend, we're going to see a huge number. We might even see over 3,000 auctions nationally. Um, I think Sydney's getting up to about 1,500, Melbourne almost uh, 1,300. So really huge number of auctions. So it'll be a good litmus test this weekend. But you saw last weekend, Sydney 71%, Melbourne a little bit lower, 65. Um, so still pretty stable numbers. Um, you know, still we're seeing two to three genuine bidders at an auction, um, not the sort of five or 10 that we were seeing during the COVID crazy times. What's happening in prices in each of the capital cities? Well, we've seen nationally 8.9% increase. Um, the standout has obviously been Perth, 18.3% rise, followed by Brisbane, 15.6, then Adelaide, 11.8, Sydney, 10.6, and Melbourne's been dragging the chain around four and, um, and Canberra 1.6. So quite a mixed bag of results. Um, and it just goes to show it's also good to have exposure in your portfolio across different um, locations so you can take advantage of growth longer term. So if we just look at the last rolling averages over the last uh, three months, you can see there's the, it's, it's following this natural curve. Um, when we saw interest rates start to kick in around uh, March, 20, uh, sorry, uh, March 22, um, and, and then we see the, the, the slide down in pricing. Um, yeah, so prices have really certainly moderated, um, but I think of the expectation now of rate cuts, you'll start to see them curving back up again in, in most areas. Sales volumes has been a really interesting one. Um, I haven't got the listing, some reason CoreLogic have got a problem with their, their total and, and new listing volumes charts, but I'll be getting that next month, Tim Lawless assures me. Um, but you can see that the volume numbers have really ticked up. So finally, vendors are getting a bit more confident that the market is, is going to be a good time to sell. So what's good news for buyers, um, it's bringing a bit more stabilisation to prices. Um, but you can still see here that the, the, monthly, um, the, the monthly sales volume is still well down below the five-year average. Um, but the, the volumes are ticking up, which is good news. 
Days on market, um, again, yeah, mixed bag of results. Um, Perth is obviously, again, the standout. 12 days to sell a home, so property's going on the contract very, very quickly there. Uh, Brisbane, 23 days. So, you know, we're seeing, you know, properties up there. If you can get them under contract, get them under control, get a two-week pest and build time and 21 days to get your finance approved, you're in good stead. Um, and Sydney and Melbourne, you're yeah, getting back more toward the averages of, of 40, 42 days used to be the longer-term average. So we're pretty much on par with, a more normalised market in those two capital cities as well. Dwelling approvals. Now, this is the one I want to harp on about, uh, Theo, that we sort of mentioned and alluded to. Um, I've got a couple of slides here to show. This is going way back to January 94. But you look at the decade average for houses there. Um, you know, we should be around every month, we should be doing around 10,000 or more a month, but it's dropped to decade average low. Same for apartments as well. So just as we said, at the same time we've got massive migration, there's not enough development approvals going through the local councils. So that's having a massive effect on supply. Um, the Urban Development uh, Institute just released their land report. Again, clearly shows that population is, is rapidly rising at the same time that uh, the dwelling approval um, growth is, is, is hitting an all-time low. So. An unfortunate time if you're a renter, a uh, good time if you're an investor. Um, and again, again, their they're forecast for completions and every, every state pretty much is trending down, unfortunately. So these are forecasts over the next three years for each of the capital cities, but it's showing for various reasons that uh, completions are trending down. So um, yeah, not good news. And it's certainly the, the government's ambition of building, what is it, 1.2 million homes. Um, I think even uh, the ex-director of Mervax, Susan Lord Horwitz, uh, said it was going to be a pretty ambitious and fanciful target. Yeah, extremely ambitious. Yeah, so that's something that, you know, good Good if you're an investor. Um, rents, we've talked a bit about rents and we've seen dramatic increases in rents in, in most of the capital cities. Um, so I guess the message here is that if you're a landlord, um, do review the rent that you're charging um, and you'd make a decision personally as to how far you put it up, obviously in, mar in line with market. Uh, and also bear in mind, you know, what sort of long-term tenants and how they're keeping the property, but definitely an opportunity to increase your cash flow to help cope with those higher interest rates uh, across your portfolio if you can. Um, we're also starting to see investors. So the proportion of you lending for investment housing um, is, starting to is starting to kick up a bit. So you can see the longer term average around 34%. We're seeing that investors are now representing 36.7% of that investment uh, lending. So I think this will jump even higher, again, probably up to 40% or more once we see those interest rates actually materialise. And, uh, and I'm tipping the first rate cut to come in September. Um, and most of the financial markets are tipping it, unless we get a, a faster rate cut, faster uh, drop down in, in, uh, in inflation. Can I just say one thing on that note, yeah. Rich? So um, you can see that big decrease uh, in, in investor activity was actually leading into that Royal Commission, um, 2018 and 19. And that's because APRA, the banking regulator, put some hefty um, premiums, you could say, on uh, the cost of funding for investors to, to purchase mm. investment properties. And it, it probably made that housing uh, crisis even worse at the time. That was the start of it because investors stopped purchasing investment properties because if you... That's when they distinguish that a you pay a higher rate if you're an investor loan as opposed to an owner occupied loan, um, and an, ad, an additional loading if it's interest only versus P and I. Um, back then, it was about a, a percent gap between the two, and a, let's say an investor interest only rate versus principal and interest owner rock, um, it was a lesser percent. Now that that um, disparity has has dropped down to probably about 30 basis points. So I think that's also a um, a reason we're seeing investors come back. And Theo, just a question off script here. Do you think uh, that APRA are going to change their 3% serviceability buffer at all? Do you think they'd bring it down to 25 or maybe 2% if we're lucky at some point? That's a great question. It should have been on script um, because <laughs> it's a, it's the, it's been um, sort of speculated a lot. And APRA actually came out... Um, maybe about three or four months ago now, was, yeah, to the, to, toward the tail end of last year. And um, people were scrutinizing that 3% buffer they put on uh, your actual rate when assessing home loans. So right now they're assessing people's affordability at a nine, nine and a half percent interest rate, which is just a little bit excessive. We're not going to see interest rates go up to nine, nine and a half percent. 
Um, and that 3% buffer was introduced when rates were at 2% um, and making sure people, you know, were calculating affordability at, at five. Mm -hmm. That made sense. But now that the, when they introduced it, you know, it was a different landscape and it's irrelevant now. However, APRA has come out. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I do think it's going to change, but APRA have, have come out a few months ago and said they are not going to interfere with the federal um, government's intentions on tackling inflation. And they'll only look at reviewing this once the federal government have got inflation toward yeah. that two, 3% target. That makes a that, lot of sense because if they, if they drop it at 2%, it's just going to reignite investor activity and potentially push inflation higher at some point, right? Which I think inevitably will happen, but mm -hmm. it's going to be as we start seeing rates come back down. So yeah. in about a year or two, I think we're going to see that the floodgates open on lending. Um, it's going to be easier to borrow money. Um, and that's when they're probably trying to kickstart the economy because the the uh, increased yep. interest rate environment has somewhat, has somewhat sort of slowed yep. things down probably to, to a mm. point they need to reignite it again. I guess that's just another reason to use a good uh, finance broker in this case, because unless you know what's happening behind the scenes, you won't know these little nuances. And, and I guess the you know, being you being tapped into what the banks are thinking, what APRA is doing, makes a huge, huge difference in in being an earlier mover in this case. Yeah, and no, I appreciate that that shout actually. Um, and we do highlight uh, changes like that in our monthly newsletter to our database. So. Um, if you are a customer of ours or if you're soon to be, don't click unsubscribe on our newsletter because you'll you'll hear about those changes, for example, by APRA um, in our monthly newsletter. Mm, cool. So just a quick, um, at this point, just a summary of where I see things at. Uh, as I said, population growth is definitely going to out and our migration will outstrip supply. So classic economic conundrum um, is going to lead to further price increases. Um, Portable locations, um, as we've seen, the, the people are moving um, to more affordable areas simply because that's all they can afford. Um, we're seeing the top end of the market, there's a lot of cash transactions happening. They're not as affected by interest rates. So really strong demand in the premium suburbs of Melbourne, Brisbane and Sydney. Um, that's going to continue. Downsizers, very much active in this market. They've had great property growth over the last five years. We're seeing some downsizers do it earlier than they anticipate, uh, even before the kids leave home, and taking one or two kids with them. Um, rents are going to keep rising. And as I said, confidence is rebuilding. So that's sort of my, my market summary snapshot. What I want to talk about now is just um, briefly touch on these forecasts that the banks put out. Um, and there's there's always a joke about economists about, you know, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing and always change their assumptions and whatever. But I honestly think a lot of these forecasts are very conservative. This is Westpac's forecast. Um, they're predicting Sydney will do 6%, Melbourne 3 Brisbane 4% only, Perth 8 um, I think Brisbane's going to do about 11% this year. I think Sydney will do about 7 or 8%. Um, and Perth will probably do 10 You know, So I think a lot of these numbers are, for whatever reason, they're conservative. They're not taking into account all of the demographic and other factors that are happening in the economy. But yeah, just take it with for what it is. Um, now, migration. Um, as I said, we've seen massive uh, drop off in migration during the COVID where it was zero coming in. And then we've had, you know, within a, a one year period, over 510,000 people come into the country trying to find a roof over their head. So huge impact on the rental market and on this, and on this housing market. Um, and we're expecting that, that number to sort of moderate to about 380, 400,000 next year and probably 350 the year after. So, you know, over, you know, 1.3 million people in three year period is, is very dramatic. Biggest we've had since the start of the post-war um, migration program. Um, so there's some more trends as we said there. Um, where are these everyone gonna live? Um, I'm not gonna go into that debate, but obviously I said, people are moving around to try and find housing that, that fits their personal, their situation. Um, to the question, is now a good time to buy? That was sort of one of the topics of our, our webinar today. Um, I think it's a really good time to buy when you can afford to buy. That's really my answer to that question. It's not so much trying to pick whether it's going to be March 2024 or September 24 or, or January 25. Um, buy when you can afford to buy, but do it strategically. But there is a window in the next six months where this higher economic pain that people are going through and mortgage stressed owners are a bit more negotiable or vulnerable. Um, so it does provide a good opportunity to buy. Um, a lot of people can't do it because they simply can't afford it. But if you can, uh, it certainly opens up some, some opportunities because if you decide to wait till say this time next year, when there's been one, two or three rate cuts, 
guaranteed there'll be five, six, seven people standing at auction trying to compete with you versus two or three today. Um, so I can pretty much mark my words on that. Can I, so, I'm yeah. going to jump in on that note as sure. well, Rich. Just one thing I feel always that people never really um, look back and say, oh, oh geez, I'm glad, I'm glad I waited to, to purchase. But the most common thing we hear is, um, geez, I wish I bought a year or two ago when I was thinking about it. Yeah. And the other thing that we see from a, the finance end in terms of when you can afford to do so, some things externally are outside of your control. And you know, if you're, you, if you're working for an employer that's paying you bonuses and all of a sudden that employer goes through a bit of a tough time and you miss your bonuses, all of a sudden, you know, the, the idea of purchasing a property is not feasible anymore and it's outside of your control. Mm. Um, so if you're in a position to execute, I, I, I strongly agree, just when you can do so, mm. execute. Well, the other thing I was going to say too is that like the banks don't ring you up and do a full assessment of your loans every year. Once you've got that 25, 30 year loan in place, you're good to go, right? Unless exactly. you're yeah. refinance, right? But it's it's great. So you can, you know, draw if you if you get a bit stuck, you can possibly draw money from a, an offset account. I'm sure you set up buffers for your, your clients. So yeah, so there's ways to get through. Um, let's have a look at biopsychology. I created this sort of uh, I guess what I call the cycle of property emotions, just so we're aware of of the different things that you go through in your mind when you're thinking about buying properties. Um, you start with a, a level of confidence thinking, yeah, I'm going to get my next home or my next investment property. You're pretty excited. Um, you get pretty on a bit of a high when you found it, you buy it. And then you start to see some negative headlines. It might be that China's going to invade Taiwan or the Wall Street market's about to collapse or Trump's back in power or whatever it is, you know. Um, and then you start letting those ne negative energy get into you and you start being alarmed and end up feeling a bit depressed. Um, but then you jump on a webinar like this and you get more reassured, realize that you know the sky's not going to fall and you come back to that level of confidence. So all, the whole point of this slide is simply to be aware of the various emotions that you go through and learning how to manage those emotions and deal with it um, is a really important part of the buying process from getting your finance through to, to purchasing and negotiating. So, you know, and us as buyers agents, we try to remove as much emotion from the process as possible and give that independent advice along the way. Um, so I won't go into the economic headwinds and tailwinds, except to say that there are headwinds, um, but there's more tailwinds than headwinds. Again, I'll let everyone read these in the, in the catch-up slides. I wanna get through to, I guess, some opportunities in the current market. Um, so as I've mentioned, the next six months is gonna provide a really good opportunity for investors. So if you haven't bought yet to get into it, or if you've got multiple properties to buy another one. So I think there's good opportunities to buy well. Um, the upsizes and the downsizer market are going to be much more active. Um, people looking to improve their digs and, and get something new. Prestige buyers, we're seeing strong demand from both expats and local buyers uh, on our books trying to, to get a, a slice of a waterfront property. Um, in the commercial space, we're seeing lots of investors using their self-managed super fund, for example, um, to buy assets uh, that are cash positive and really get set up in that space. So a lot of activity in the commercial space. Um, Alberto de Gravis, who's our, our key commercial guy, is, uh, is run off his feet with Inquire, which is great at the moment, but we're seeing, yes, yeah, in good demand uh, coming through there. Um, also opportunities to development. Um, in all of the capital cities, um, there's a lot of rezoning and proposed rezoning about to go on while the governments try to increase supply. In New South Wales, uh, there's a thing called the TOD, the Transport Oriented Development Opportunities uh, for a number of suburbs around Sydney. So properties within 4,800 to 800, square, 800 metres of a station um, can potentially get an R3 or an R4 zoning. Uh, with six story height limit. So there's good opportunities if you live in those areas. Um, yeah, come and talk to us. We probably have a, a client that wants to buy it, but there's good opportunities uh, for, for developers in those, those spaces. Um, and also opportunities in, in rooming houses and granny flats to get higher yields. So there's, there's lots of opportunities out there. Um, I wanna do something now similar to what Theo put up, but just uh, my own analysis of where property prices uh, are gonna be in the next 25 years. So here's the drum roll. You've already seen Theo's numbers, but mine are pretty similar. So what I did is I analyzed the, all the, the median value um, using our friends at Microburbs to analyze 25 years worth of past data and extrapolate that to the next 25 years into the future, to the year 2048. I did this at the end of last year. That's why it's got 2048. 
So over the last 25 years, we've seen Sydney increase on average 7.3%, Melbourne 7.4%, Brisbane 7.5%. So today's median house value in Sydney is about 1.3, 1.4. It's going to be over $7 million by the year 2048. Now, 25 years doesn't sound like a long time, but bloody hell, $7.9 million is a, is a big number. Um, same for Melbourne, going from almost you know, 925 to 5.5 million and Brisbane from 830 up to just over 5 million. Um, so when I showed my team these numbers, they went far out, Rich. They're big numbers. How, how's, that, how's anyone going to afford a property? Well, exactly. That's the question. And I think it's the, the question is hopefully this is motivating for, for people watching to take action sooner rather than later. Um, because once you're in the market, you can enjoy the ride. But when you're sitting outside of that, that scheme, it's a lot harder to crack into it unless you've got intergenerational wealth that's going to be passed on to you. Um, similar numbers for units as well here. Um, again, uh, units haven't performed as well as houses simply because land content tends to drive value higher. Um, but again, pretty significant numbers jumping up from where we are today to where they'll be in the year 2048. But I'll send through copies of those so you can have a look at that. Um, just before we jump into case studies and then we'll go to q and I just want to give an outline of, of what we do as buyers agents. Um, some of you have used our services and, and thinking about it. But essentially, whether you use a buyer's agent or do this on your own, you've got to do these seven steps. Um, and your first step is get finance approval. Um, then second step is get your strategy right. Think about where you're going to buy. Do the research. Thirdly, shortlist the, the right kind of property and find the right ones. And then it comes down to drilling down into what's it actually worth, working out the value of that property using comparable sales analysis. Then you've got to do your due diligence, pest and build, strata searches, DA consents, look at all of the, the other council factors, negotiate it, organise contract review, and lastly, go through to settlement and a property manager. Most people on their own take around six to 12 months to do that. Um, my team do it in about one to two months on average. Um, so we really speed up that, that process and help pinpoint really the right locations that's, that's going to uh, identify the opportunities for you. Um, there's some of the, the key benefits and we do get access to a lot of off-market properties and, and filter the property. So it takes you takes away all that time saving that you do checking out properties on a weekend. We all do that for you and give you a lot of confidence. Um, we charge a, a fixed fee to do that. If you've got any, uh, any uh, interest in that service, then we can send you out our, our fee proposal. But essentially it ranges between 1.65 to 2% depending on, on your price point. And that will get you a professional buyer's agent working alongside you. Um, so Theo, I'll just quickly go through uh, some case studies. Um, what time is it now? Yeah, good. We've got almost about, I'll probably finish in about three minutes and then we'll open up for Q&A. Um, this was a property I bought for a, a luxury downsizer a couple of weeks ago uh, in Curl Curl. Um, the client wanted uh, a waterfront property, northeast facing aspect with a view. Um, I contacted all my local agent database and literally within two weeks, I just couldn't believe it, a perfect property popped up. Clients were from interstate, um, they flew down, I showed them about four or five, six other properties, um, but certainly just, just like the impression of this photo is, it was just a perfect location. Um, throw the towel over your shoulder, walk down to the beach, have a swim at the pool and uh, walk to the local shops, it was just ideal. So um, yeah, they were extremely happy to say the least. Um, we bought this one, or the guys bought this one just recently in Roseville. Uh, Roseville's median house price is 3.5. Um, and this was sold through an agent that we thought possibly didn't do as good a job as they could have. So we're able to take advantage of that. Um, Matt was incredible and they turned around the due diligence in five hours. Got our building inspector there, got the contract reviewed, and just the speed of execution enabled our buyer to, to able to get through this property and beat off two other buyers that were almost willing to put in higher offers. So yeah, that, that speed of execution made a huge difference there. Um, this is one we just bought again off market, Eastern Suburbs, um, just the other day. Uh, where was this one? This one was in Western Sydney, um, really good for an investor. Um, managed to pick this up for a million and 75, which has got a granny flat out the back. So giving a 5.1% yield. And again, really, again, walking distance to shops. So uh, that the idea of getting that secondary income, uh, particularly in Western Sydney, uh, it's gonna benefit from the uplift from the second, uh, second airport as well. 
Um, what else can I tell you? A couple of others. Newcastle. I'm going to skip through a bunch of these. Um, all right. Uh, Brisbane, as I said, great area that we're buying for a lot of investors, particularly in that affordable range. Uh, we bought this one for 545000 uh, um, not much to write home about, but just a nice, neat package. Um, again, the client will be able to add a granny flat. It's big enough uh, to fit that at the back and uh, rents for 575. So about a 5.2, 5.3% yield, but definitely scope to, to go higher. Um, that was one Nick bought up in the Hills District. Um, yeah, really very competitive auction on that one, but managed to get our home buyer into that one. Melbourne, um, that's a market I think has definitely got some legs. Um, this is a beautiful property we bought for our client overseas. Um, uh, expat wanted to be right on the bay, directly waterfront views. Uh, managed to get it under, under the guide, which was pretty cool. Um, one thing I just mentioned, for any investor that wants to look at a higher yielding strategy, um, we've formed a partnership with a company that can build rooming houses. These are not boarding houses. These are rooming houses. So they're five-bedroom houses that will deliver about a 6.5% net yield, about 8 to 8.5% gross yield. And you rent out each room individually, just like you would a normal house, but through a local property manager. Um, take about 12 months from go to woe to build these properties. Um, hard to find, but we have access and, and connections to get these things done. Um, but you will need a construction loan. So you've got to settle on the land and then you'll have about a 36-week build time to get this done. Uh, but yeah, let me know if anyone has any interest in that sort of uh, that kind of structure. Uh, talking about apartments in, in Melbourne, this is a great example, Theo, of one we just bought at the end of last year for a, a, an expat client that's returning. Um, and they want an investment overlooking Albert Park. We got this property for 618,000. It really should have been worth, I reckon, about almost 700. One of those beautifully designed uh, Melbourne buildings with about 18 apartments in it, really boutique block. Um, but they're going to get some strong capital growth just simply because of where it's located. So that was a good buy. I wouldn't be buying in things like Docklands or some of the other pockets where there's just too much, too much supply. Um, I'm going to skip through. There's lots of examples in Brisbane, Gold Coast. Um, what else can I tell you? Again, we try to find dual income where possible. Um, oh, that was helping a lovely first home buyer a couple of weeks ago. Amanda got this one for our client in Melbourne. Um, typical underquoting scenario and uh, managed to beat other buyers at, at auction. Um, commercial, just briefly finish on this one. Um, we're buying a lot of uh, industrial units, fully leased, um, typically with five plus five year leases. And this is one Alberto did recently. We purchased up in Brisbane, 1.575 with a 6.4% net yield and, and built in 4% rental increases. So great, uh, great buy. You generally need around a 70% uh, loan to value ratio. So slightly higher LVR, but a uh, good opportunity. Mm. Um, I'll skip these last two. So I'd like to move to Q&A time, uh, Theo, and I'll just stop sharing my screen and just see if we've got some Q&As here. So what have we got? So Greg is asking, is off the plan investment a bit too risky at this point in time? What do you think? I've got some comments, but what are your thoughts, Theo, on off the plans? Well, it is um, definitely specific to each individual project you're looking at and the marketplace within the project. Some areas... Um, there's a huge amount of supply um, and the, and some of the developers are a bit slip slop slap in their builds, you could say. Um, but then there's some great developers who've got great stock in markets, markets with limited supply. Um, and what you're paying is, is decent value for what they're building. Um, and with a long settlement, sometimes you can, uh, I guess, inherit some growth in that settlement period, but it can go both ways. Sometimes the developer has factored in growth into that long settlement. And when you do settle, it's not quite um, the value you thought it was going to be worth or what you paid. Mm. I would just say, um, yeah, off the plan sort of is a bit on the nose, unfortunately, because of the um, mascot towers fiasco and also the one out at Homebush. Um, but as, as there I said, there are some really good quality developers out there. And, um, you know, for example, Mervac have a really strict uh, building protocol. Um, I know a couple of developers personally that I'd be happy to buy from because I know their process. Um, I wouldn't say it's completely too risky. I would just be very cautious. You make sure that you get your contract reviewed heavily. Um, 
Also sunset clauses are now um, out. So your developers used to be able to cancel a contract within, I think it was two or three years if they didn't finish. And uh, what happened was when the market went crazy, they'd get to the end of the three year period, cancel the contract and resell it for like 20% more to another buyer. Um, they can't do that now, it's illegal. But um, yeah, things like checking the, the list of inclusions, um, checking the, the strata fees, but you know, developers have got a tough gig, right? So just talking to one yesterday and when they build an apartment group, they have to have a 3% bond for the strata plan. So they've got to cough up a big number just to kickstart the strata plan going. So, and the building commissioner is just being ruthless at the moment. He is just ripping shreds off a lot of developers, which is good, um, but it's it's tough. Uh, yeah, it's really tough out there in build, building land. So that's why you're not seeing as many developments because it's a lot harder. Mm. Um, David's asking, Rich, the stats say that one in four properties being bought using cash. Do you think that will continue? Um, yes and no. It depends where. Um, I think in the more premium areas um, where they've got wealthier buyers, that stat's probably more appropriate. But I think for, you know, the middle ring and outer suburbs, I think it's nowhere near that statistic. You know, what's your thoughts on that, uh, Theo? That, that stat's mainly be driven by downsizers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with our baby booming sort of aging population, um, that there's a lot of downsides that are selling, let's say a two, $3 million property and, and buying something for one and a half, two, and they have no debt. Um, and that's, you know, I think a, a big driver of, of that statistic, which might change. Um, but yeah, downsizers are always going to be, you know, predominantly cash buyers. Mm. Uh, and hopefully everyone can get to that stage in their life as well. Mm. Um, Joe's asking, do banks make property buyers ever gets aware of distressed mortgages before going to market? Uh, uh, look, we do get occasionally a little bit of wind of something, but if it's a mortgagee sale, typically it has to go to public auction because the mortgagee can't be seen to be favouring any particular party and they need to be impartial. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, I think it's more I try to uncover, if I can, through my connections, distress sellers rather than mortgagee sales. Mortgagee sales are often... You get stacks of people turning up um, and, and there might be something wrong with the property as well. So it's a tricky one. Mm. I have to say um, on that note, people are um, a lot more sort of savvy these days and they generally are going to make a decision before they get themselves in those positions. Um, they're not going to let you know th themselves get into arrears and, and then wait to sell. And even if they are a distressed sale and they are struggling with their repayments, whether they be in arrears or not, they're also going to keep their cards quite close to their chest and not let um, real estate agents and, and sort of various professionals know that they're they're finding it tough at the moment because then they feel like they might be taken advantage of. Um, like I touched on earlier, the data for mortgage arrears is six months old. Um, the only reason we think that there's a bit more arrears to come is from some of the banks that specialize in refinancing arrears um, loans. There's been an increase with, with Pepper, for example, doing huge amounts of refinances for, for clients in arrears. Mm. Yep. Um, Lucilla is asking, would like more info on rooming houses? Yes, yeah, so Lucilla, just reach out to us afterwards and I can send you all the info on the rooming houses. Um, buying in a self-managed super fund. Actually, that's one for you, Theo. If you're buying, can you do a house and land contract in a self-managed super fund? Great question. The answer is yes, providing that when you settle, the house is is built. So right. some of those projects, they will wrap up the contract yes. as one and you don't, and the the person selling you the lot of land is the person delivering the, the house as well. Mm. Um, in that situation, yes. But if you're set, settling on the land and then having to do a separate loan for the development, no. Um, you can't do it that way. Yeah, typically I've found like with those rooming houses, it might cost another fifty to sixty-five thousand dollars more because the um, the vendor has to carry the interest cost of the land over the period of time that they're building. But again, oh, if you're buying a self-managed super fund, it could still be worth it when you do your numbers. That that is another hot topic. Those um uh, sort of rooming houses or boarding houses in um in Brisbane. Typically, you don't finance the costs. You just buy the property and allow enough of a buffer with what you're um, borrowing to purchase the property. You, I, I believe it's like 50 grand to convert a house into a rooming house. Is it, is it right, Rich? Yeah. Um, and you just account for having an extra 50 to fund that in cash. Yep, correct. Yep, that's it. 
Um, Effie is asking, do you believe investment property loans should be interest only or P&I? A yeah, great question. What's your take on that one? Theo? Personally, I think you should definitely have a P&I loan purely because the rate is lower. Hmm. The old school way of thought um, where accountants would recommend go interest only on your investment property and P&I on your owner occupied property, that was pre-2019 when the APRA, um, when the banking regulator APRA put those changes on uh, IO and, and P&I loans. Um, when all rates were the same, yes, that made sense. But when you have to pay, call it half a percent premium, even just 30 basis points extra uh, to, to pay IO or interest only, then the premium outweighs potentially reducing the debt on your investment versus reducing debt on your on your own occupied property because that's the goal, right? That's why accountants recommended it. They recommended um, going interest only on your investment and P&I on your home so that you would focus on paying down the, the debt on your home first. But that minor deduction loss you get um, by doing P&I on your investment, you're talking, let's say you reduce the loan by five, 10 grand a year, it's 5% on the five, 10 grand a year. It's the interest on that principal that you're missing out on. So you're, you're talking like what, $500 a year um, when you might be paying $5,000 extra in interest to have it interest only. Yep. Just as a as footnote, I changed all my, when that change brought in, I changed all mine to P&I uh, for that reason, because it was cheaper and I'm also building up greater equity. Uh, but anything, I just have an offset account to uh, to keep the mortgage, uh, the principal place of residence mortgage lower. Uh, Anonymous is asking Hamilton Island, good yield, but it seems difficult to get a loan for a property there. Um, mm. Firstly, I'd say, is Hamilton Island the best place to buy? I'd probably suggest, look, I was there last year, lovely island. I played golf on Dent Island, never done that before. That was a lot of fun, lost about 30 balls. Um, but I would say there's probably other areas I'd recommend simply because of the entry into that area. My, my view, yeah, whenever I'm buying a property, I want to know I can get in and out if I'm in trouble. Like buying in a really limited area or, or there might be some issues on, on tenure there, I would rather be buying an asset I know I can exit quite quickly. Um, but what's your view on Hamilton? I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan as an investor for Hamilton Island. And my number one reasoning would be, yes, exiting in and out, but um, more the fact that you, it's, you're going to struggle to get insurance on, on your investment property there. And if you can't get building insurance, you'll struggle to then get finance. So it's going to make it hard for people to purchase property there. Um, that's somewhat correlated to why the Oatley family, I think, were looking at selling that that island recently. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was quietly on the market and then publicly on the market for for some time um, because of the insurance cost for the whole island is is gone through the roof with with all these crazy cyclones that, that they've been having up there. Um, with with these um, unknown weather changes and, and, and climate change, it, it could uh, become more of an issue. And in areas like Hamilton Island, even areas like Hawkesbury River and various flood zones are becoming hard to get insurance and it will make it hard to, to borrow money. Yep, really good point. Simone's asking, how does an investor cope with extended vacancy when a commercial tenant doesn't renew the lease and you can't find a tenant? Makes us nervous about commercial buying. Yeah, I guess the, my um, theory on that, Simone, would be when you're buying a commercial property, we do a lot of due diligence into the tenant and the lease that's existing there. And you want to make sure it's a reputable business that's got you know, a good business model. Now, the second thing is, for whatever reason, that business then folded and had to vacate, that the space that they're in could be easily filled by another business that's in high demand. So we're finding a lot of these. I showed one example of an industrial unit um like a lot of those tenants there they stay for a very long time and they're in high demand right around australia particularly in outskirts of sydney brisbane gold coast and melbourne um so you don't need to be as nervous as perhaps you are and you know you can think about having a buffer as well i mean with commercial property there is a longer lead time to get a tenant and you do need to have a three to six month buffer in place if you're going to go down that route so a lot of my philosophy is you need about three to four resi properties in your portfolio, perhaps before you start thinking about commercial. That'd be my view. Any thoughts on that, Theo? Yeah, I I, I would agree with that strategy. It's definitely um, for the more sophisticated investor and it's just a risk versus reward thing, high risk, high reward. Your yields are going to be a bit higher, but you you might have a period with, um, with, with a lack of income because it can take longer to find a tenant. But the flip side is at least those those leases are three to five years typically. So there's less 
tenancy turnover. Mm. And the next question from Mark is for you as well, for Mark. Yeah, so um, it's a broad question and hard, how to, uh, hard to answer. So how to structure, how do banks structure a, a commercial mortgage? It is, it's very different to residential. Um, you don't get pre-approvals as such. Um, it is case by case on firstly and, and, and most importantly, the asset. So what you're, what you're buying is, is really um, correlated to the, the finance term. So the strata industrial unit, like Rich was giving an example of, or, or a, an office in the, in the CBD, a strata office it, it, um every bank has a different policy to, to certain asset classes. Um, it's, Lower LVR, that's for sure. You're, you're typically looking at a 60 to 70% um, LVR is the ideal level for banks. You can get up to 80, but you're going to, you're going to pay for, for a higher LVR. Um, and yes, you can get a, a still a, a 30 year mortgage in the sense that repayments will be based over, over 30 years. However, typically there's a three to or maybe even a two to five year review period um, which is normally correlated to the leases. So if you have short leases in, in a in a property, um, say two to three years, and they'll have a two to three review after leases to see that you've, you've re re uh, renewed them. Um, if they're longer leases, then it's longer reviews. Um, and that, yeah, it really does vary between banks. So definitely something to shop around. Um, if, you know, with both these questions, if, if investing in commercial is um, somewhat alarming and, and, and sort of, unknown for you um it, it might be an opportunity but if you still want to obviously diversify your, your portfolio to rich's point about having some residential and then getting into commercial we've also launched a um commercial syndication business um it's called shore invest it's in partnership with wingate um, essentially you can purchase incremental amounts of a larger commercial asset um, we're looking at buying buildings between 25 million to 100 million and uh, minimum investment is 250 grand, but you still have leverage against the asset. It's on an asset by asset basis. So um, if you're interested, hop on our website and register your interest on, on, on Shore Invest and we can send you some of the assets that, that we're looking at syndicating. Cool, great, great answer. Um, last question, in 2048, how can uh, the average Aussie say his house worth 7.9 if Joe Aussie doesn't have the ability to buy it for that much? <laughs> so maybe I freaked everybody out by putting those numbers in there, Theo. <laughs> Um, well, I think the answer to that question is it's going to be flipping tricky to buy a property for that much money in 2048. But as I said, there'll be an intergenerational wealth transfer um, for those who've got parents or relatives that have got property that can then help them get into the market. The other thing is I think there'll be a greater proportion in 2048 of people renting properties. I mean, at the moment, it's about a third rent, a third are paying off their mortgage and a third own their home outright. I think, unfortunately, we're not building enough homes and it's getting harder for people to buy their homes. So I think we'll be at 35 or even 40% renters by the time we get to 2048. What do you think, Theo? Yeah, well, also um, bear in mind that the, uh, the average income is going to increase a lot. I know we haven't had much wage growth historically for the last 10 mm. years, but I think you True. might have seen in the last few weeks it's jumped to, to 100,000 average salary across Australia now, and that is in line with inflation growth. So mm. um, I... Yeah, it will be a challenge. Um, the other thing that gets sort of um, thrown around the media once again quite quite often is the household income or the average income ratio to um, uh, house prices. Um, that ratio, yeah, it jumped from, let's say, three times the average um, income was what people paid for a house maybe 20, 30 years ago, and now they're saying seven times. But they're also looking at the average income of an individual and the difference between now and 30 years ago is that um, both couples are typically working these days in a household. Um, it's dual income. Um, so really look into that data and make sure that it's, it's portraying the accurate message because I think gone are the days where, um, you know, it is assumed that only one income is going to be the household income. And it quite often now uh, in our application, more than half the time it's dual income. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Look, I just want to be mindful and respectful of time. I think we're going to have to leave it there, Theo. Um, yes, we'll be sending out a recording of this uh, presentation today along with the slides to everybody. Um, but just want to say thank you so much, Theo, for participating today, sharing your wisdom with us. And Thanks um, for having me, Rich. Yeah, it's been great. Really love the answer. Quick Q&A section at the end. Uh, there's always good value out of that. And thank you for everyone watching. And uh, please reach out to us. Um, the email addresses and, and contact details for both our companies are there. 
Love to work with you. Wish you all the best in your property journey and uh, we hope you have a great day. Thanks again. Bye for now.